Hello, and welcome back to the Sprinkler Coffee Club. I'm so glad you could join us. My name is Marshall Kirkpatrick. I am your host here at the Sprinkler Coffee Club, where we like to talk about technology, culture, where the two intersect, digital transformation, customer experience, customer care, and how to do it all with smarts and integrity. I am so pleased to have our guest with us today uh, that we have joining us. Uh, she is the author of a really informative, inspiring, and enjoyable new read on the subject of online communities. Uh, her book is titled Building Brand Communities, How Organizations Succeed by Creating Belonging. Carrie Melissa Jones, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to dive in. Me too. I really appreciated this uh, opportunity to read your book. Yet uh, there is just a wealth of expert perspectives and knowledge and information and analysis and a lot of original thinking in it. Congratulations on writing such a good book. Thank you. I have to give Charles, uh, my co-author, a lot of credit <laughs> for that as well. How community-minded of you. That's good. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I do genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, recommend uh, Carrie's book to anyone who's building a, a brand community. And I know my team at Sprinkler is excited to read it as well. Uh, and right out of the gate, uh, it was striking to me to read your discussion, Carrie, about the difference between real communities and Mirage communities. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit to start about what makes a real community. Yeah, so this was one of the first um, pieces actually of the book that Charles and I wrote because we see this so often is the difference between a real community and a Mirage community or a fake community. Um, so a real community is really just any group of people who are brought together, have a shared identity or shared interests, who come together more than one time, so it's not just a one-time event, um, and who share a mutual concern for one another. And that can be on a personal level, but also on, a, on the level of saying, you know, I am a UCLA alumni, uh, I also care about the welfare of other UCLA alumni. So um, that's what a real community is. A Mirage community, which we are seeing a plethora of right now, but this has been going on for years and years and years, is when people use the word community and it evokes all of these promises of, of mutual care, uh, warmth, friendship, and then they just leave the word hanging there and don't actually put in the effort and the work that it takes to have those real communities and real connections. So marketers are <laughs> really infamous for doing this. And um, I we had to call it out because there's many social reasons for that. Um, one is that we're in the midst of a loneliness epidemic. And so to use that word incorrectly is actually going to exacerbate current issues that we have going on in our world. Mm, wow. Not just uh, cause a, a failure of a brand's efforts, but yes. actively doing harm. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily intentionally, right? So doing harm, yeah. unintentional harm with the best of intentions, because when you use that word, I think people really do want to build community and build connection. But understanding that it takes special investment is is critical because just saying the word does not magically make it appear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I do appreciate that that voice of caution and uh, and putting it in terms of social impact. I, I wonder on the flip side, if you could share with us some of your favorite positive examples. There's so many in the book, such a wide range of of different communities that you you discuss in detail. Uh, can you pick one or two to share with us uh, in order to have a picture in our minds of, of what a really great community looks like? Yeah, so the book talks about both online and offline communities um, for the purposes of our time today. And in the midst of the pandemic, I will talk specifically about uh, online communities. 
But I will say that one of my favorite communities of all time is the Harley Owners Group community. And that is primarily an offline effort run by local dealerships. And it, this is my parents are members. And so I've watched as that community has truly made their lives better, has helped them make lifelong friendships, has just enhanced every aspect of their lives. And so that is my favorite, but it's mostly offline. And they, as far as I know, are not planning any centralized online efforts at this point. But that was an epic story that you told in the a book about the way that that, that community I was know. built and just saved the company in large part was a, was a big part of the salvation of the company from bankruptcy. Yeah. Yeah. It is an incredible story. Like the way that the entire, I think the critical thing to take from that story, and I'll share a little bit of it here, is that the executive leadership were part of building that community from day one. And that is so critical that you have not only some uh, in the power of this and who really cares. Some of the listeners may know Harley has been around for over 100 years. It's based in Milwaukee, which is where I am right now. And uh the company's been through a lot of ups and downs. You know, it's been through world wars. It has been through the recessions, multiple recessions in um, United States history. And in the 1980s, they actually uh, were bought by a private equity firm. And that private equity firm was called AMF. And AMF was primarily known actually for making bowling balls. And so this, this company in Pennsylvania, AMF, uh, said, well, you know, we can make motorcycles too, right? Like that's a, that's a thing we can do. And we'll bring it all into one, like our supply chain, we'll centralize it. Um, from an operation standpoint, it made a lot of sense because they had all the materials and machinery to do it. Now, unfortunately, making bowling balls and making motorcycles not not that similar. Um, so the quality of Harley dropped considerably at the same time as a recession hit in the 1980s. And so what happened was the private equity firm didn't want Harley anymore. They were just going to like clean their hands of it, but no one would buy it. No one wanted to run the company and nobody had hope that it would live on. But the executive team, one of whom was a, a descendant of the original founders, of, of Harley Davidson said, you know what, we can't let this company just deteriorate. We have to make sure it lives on. And so they all went to Pennsylvania and they bit back and then got on their Harleys from Pennsylvania and symbolically rode all the way from Pennsylvania to Milwaukee with scholar riders, with dealers. And the CEO at the time actually credits the Harley owners group for turning the company around. And not only, I mean, you can imagine not only would this, this effort galvanize their riders and their customers, but also gave them a ton of insights and boosted morale at a time when it probably was fairly low. Um, and so they had thought maybe we'll get 20,000 members or so, and it'll be really fun in the 80s. And now it has multiple millions of members all over the world. My parents have literally traveled, you know, all over the United States, at least, and met with Harley riders who were once strangers now friends. Um, and it's just all enabled by this decentralized effort. It's incredible. So yeah, I was only supposed oh, to talk about online community, but I, <laughs> that's a great story. And your personal connection yeah. to it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I'm more of a bowling ball guy than a Harley guy myself, but I, <laughs> uh, even I can, uh, I mean, that's an inspiring story. And the way in your book, you, you cover the breadth from Twitch online gaming communities to global interfaith, uh, religious reconciliation and peace groups to the Harley owners group and find common threads and qualities uh, across uh, all the most successful communities is really, really quite striking and, and empowering. Mm -hmm. I will say, yeah, we have um, Twitch is a great example of another really inspiring online community. Um, and they have meetups all over the world generally, but now they're doing a lot of virtual uh, gatherings and things like that. Um, but that actually makes my job and Charles's job quite a challenge at times because a lot of corporations don't understand, like, why would I do something that an interfaith group is doing? What could I really learn from that? Um, or, you know, uh, political movements or political campaigns will think, why would I want to do what Google's doing? I want to do the opposite. A progressive movement might think, like, I want to do the opposite of what Google is doing or what Amazon is doing. Um, 
but the foundations are all the same. It's just how you execute on them that must be different. So it is mm. challenging, but there there's universal uh, principles that are applicable across the board. And speaking of the the business perspective in particular, you you have a lot of good discussion in the book about the the need to make a, an effective community really serve the the interests of all parties. I wonder if you could speak to us a little bit about some of your favorite business cases uh, to get businesses excited about investing in communities, but also thoughts about how that uh, can be mutually beneficial with participants that have their own interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it must be mutually beneficial um, in order to be beneficial for the members and for people to keep signing the checks <laughs> for the employees and the technology to build these. It must benefit the organization as well. So when I see that um, kind of teeter and, and go out of balance, that's when uh, communities are in trouble generally from a from an organizational perspective. Um, but in terms of, you would ask for examples of those? Uh, examples and, and yeah, yeah. What are some, if some, if a business comes to you and says, a community sounds nice and, uh, and I'm sure there's lots of brand upside and everyone would feel good about it, but what's the, what's the hard business impact that will, uh, that I, I should aspire to in terms of return on investment or, you know, just business impact of building a, a community. Mm -hmm. So in the book, we go through the seven different areas where you can make investments and those are going to vary based on what urgent needs does your organization face. No matter what those needs might be, I can almost guarantee you that building a community can help resolve those problems and resolve them faster than you ever would alone with just the um, people on your teams. So gathering outside perspectives can always help with marketing, product, uh, innovation just overall, um, just across the board can help an organization. Um, so I'm not going to go too in depth on that because it can get pretty detailed and boring, <laughs> frankly. Um, it's in the book. Um, but what I will say is one way to think about making an investment from a business standpoint is to think about the counter future. What will happen if you do not invest in First, listening to the people important to your business, whether that's your customers, your partners, your vendors, and then in actually gathering their input, co-creating alongside them, or just bringing them into the process. So uh, one example we give in the book is what happens when Twitch, what happened when Twitch actually released uh, a major update to their platform, their feed, which deprioritized long videos because they saw in the analytics, you know, people like short videos, people are watching these short clips. And uh, so they figure like, okay, let's just go with the data. Um, but they didn't consult anyone externally on this decision. Now they're all gamers internally, so they thought they knew what they needed to know. But it turned out there was a within Twitch of uh, people called speedrunners. And these people play an entire game as fast as they can. At, and, and so those videos tend to be longer, right? But there's a core contingency of them on Twitch and people that just are obsessed with watching them. And when this happened, these people who had dedicated hours and hours and months to their Twitch streams and all of that suddenly saw their viewership just plummet overnight and got really upset and threatened to leave. And at that point, uh, Marcus Graham, he is the, I believe now he's the director of um, engagement. At the time he was uh, essentially their community manager. And he got on the phone with him, with one of these speedrunners, and apologized. And they quickly, he got together with the CEO and they made this sweeping change. Like we can't lose these people. They're actually the foundation of Twitch's success. And that's a great example of what can happen if you're just building because you think you know what's best without listening to the people they're actually building for. So now they actually gather a whole contingency of these power players uh, and they gather them usually in person at their offices, they'll fly them in. Um, but now they're doing virtual and listening sessions and, and community building and all kinds of stuff like that. Oh, what a, what a neat example. Yeah, that's that's just fantastic. Uh, yeah, the importance of listening. Uh, 
at Sprinkler, we talk about listening uh, to your customers, learning from them, and then loving them, uh, giving them the, the kind of experience that, that they're really looking for uh, based on that listening and, and learning. Mm -hmm. I love that. What can you tell us about, uh, there's a whole list of roles and common functions and components to an effective community uh, that you discuss. And one in particular that caught my, my eye was the, uh, the function of initiation, that, that mm -hmm. ritual. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I think what you're referring to is like the gatekeeping or the crossing through a threshold when you first join a community. Um, so this is something that applies both to in-person, face-to-face and online uh, communities. And it is critical that people know when they've actually left the outside space and moved into an inside community space. A lot of times what you see in, um, let's say like customer support forums is that it's you're you're Googling for something, maybe you're you use Microsoft and you're you're Googling for uh, some teams fix or something like that. And you find their forums because of SEO and you land on their forum page and all of a sudden there's a, a banner that says like, welcome to the community. You're, you know, like you're, you're one of our members and uh, you're like, no, I'm not, I'm an outsider. I don't, I just want the answer to this. And then I want to, I want to leave. I have no intention of sticking around here and building real relationships. Um, and it's fine for that to be the case, but let's not call that particular experience a community experience. That's a, a, a customer support experience. But for those people who really, really love, let's say, helping other Microsoft uh, users get through uh, whatever struggles they might be facing, generally these people are Microsoft consultants or you know people who make their living building on Microsoft uh, stop on Microsoft software. Um, those people might want to move deeper into being part of a community. So, what is the experience from going from an outsider to actually? maybe even applying to join this community and going through some kind of a process where you actually feel like you're noticed and seen by someone internally at Microsoft. And then you're brought into a core group of people who are just like you and who can help you grow your business, can help you um, learn things about Microsoft that you didn't know before and really go much, much deeper into the Microsoft ecosystem, right? So that's not for everyone. And so the importance of initiating those people who are the right people for the community can make all the difference. And that experience um, is, is critical because as we know, first impressions really, really matter. Um, so that really will set the tone for your future culture and, and all of these things within your community. Will you talk a little bit about prioritizing the the right people or the best people to to bring into that community it makes me think about the phrase you know if you're if you try to be all things to all people you'll end up serving serving no one uh mm -hmm. as well as, as you might uh, what what does that look like in community building yeah that's a great question so i have this when i work with marketers especially this is a really big area of struggle because um a lot of let's say marketers who are doing like social media ad buying and things like that are used to targeting like certain verticals of people or um, tags of people on on social media platforms but and then targeting messages at them and then they click and that is a conversion yay we did our thing <laughs> um, but with community building your ideal members are not necessarily the people who are buying the most from you or clicking on stuff the most. They are the people who want to collaborate with you, to co-create with you, and who are interested and invested in taking your organization where it is that you would like it to go. So it's not a one-to-one, -one, and this is what marketers have uh, some struggles with, is they'll say, well, we want to work with our loyalists um, those are the people that we want to be in our community. And I'm like, what do your loyalists have in common? And the only thing they have in common is that they're buying a lot of, let's say, makeup products from, from a large organization like a Sephora or Glossier. 
And that's not enough to build a community on. But there are contingencies within those loyalists, certainly, who are going above and beyond, who are giving you product feedback. And actually, Glossier is a great example. They bring in some of their ambassadors to actually test their products, give them feedback, and they become part of the creation process. And they have real relationships. There's one person on the team in particular whose job it is to, to foster those relationships. And... Um, yeah, yeah. So it's it's critical that we're not just equating marketing personas with community personas. They're not the same thing. Hmm. So the the most community minded of people may be a subset of any of those marketing personas. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And and also, I mean, communities don't just have to be of your customers. It can also be your partners or. Um, your employees having a community program internally at your company too. So yeah, it, it will, it'll vary who you're building for. Mm -hmm. If there was, was one piece of, of top advice or a, a taste of, of the advice that you can offer folks in uh, say for the, the community manager type role uh, in particular in creating uh, an, energizing, enjoyable, valuable experience for participants. Uh, what's the first thing that, uh, that people should look to do? Well, one of the principles we talk about in the book are, is the principle of campfires. And this is a concept that it's in juxtaposition to what we call arenas, um, which are gatherings which are giant where everyone's sort of focused on one central spectacle that's going on right and this is how traditional marketing is done um, but as you're building communities you want to be thinking about building campfires not necessarily arenas you can do some of that certainly you can have like an annual giant gathering uh, like salesforce does um but when we're thinking about campfires the, the thing about them is generally there's probably not more than 20 people around a campfire at any given time, at least not an intimate one. Um, everyone has a chance to talk. Everyone um, has the permission to not necessarily talk about uh, your brand <laughs> around a campfire. They're not necessarily telling stories about like, maybe they start out that way, but they go much deeper over time. Um, and, and there's actual like time set aside for people to get to know one another. So in building smaller experiences, we can start to learn more about people in a safe environment and start to understand who they are as full human beings and give them a chance to really feel known, seen and heard as well. So I would start there. You don't need more than three people to get something started. And I know for some organizations, that's like three people. I don't care about three people. Um, but having that foundation is important because if you are just building a community on top of shallow relationships, then the entire community will continue to be shallow. Mm. That's yeah. Well said. Well said. That's some great advice. That's some really good. Uh, that's a, a really specific actionable piece of advice about how to go about creating authentic, meaningful community as, uh, as your book and, and all of your work is so full of. Uh, so many folks, I think, uh, want to create uh, authentic community, but mm -hmm. uh, your experience and the experience of other folks that you've convened together is is uh, makes it feel so much more doable and tangible. So, really appreciate That's that. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yay! Because I also believe people really want this. They want to build this, and they also want it in their lives. We just don't know how to move forward. Mm hmm. Well, thanks for writing a book with uh, with so many <laughs> steps about how to go about it you're welcome <laughs> yeah. thank you for reading it <laughs> i'm really enjoying it yeah so uh so carrie we connected initially uh the sprinkler team and you over twitter is that a good place to connect with you are there other places that you really like to to connect with folks that are interested in learning more about what you do yeah twitter is great i'm at care mjo or find me on instagram at carrie melissa jones those are probably the place and LinkedIn as well. Um, Carrie Melissa Jones on LinkedIn. Those are the, the most reliable places to find me outside of my email inbox, which is scary. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm excited to see what kinds of things you post on Instagram. 
that uh, that'll be fun. Good. Well, I so appreciate the opportunity to connect with you and learn from you and to share uh, some of your learnings here uh, with others. Uh, folks, I, I really genuinely do recommend uh, very much uh, Carrie's book uh, called again, Building Brand Communities, How Organizations Succeed by Creating Belonging. Go in and check it out. And uh, thanks again, Carrie, so much for joining us here on the Sprinkler Coffee Club. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Take care.